Good afternoon. I want to start a little bit earlier because the, the room is packed. Uh, Bill, you will be under a lot of pressure. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you are doing a superb job. No, I asked them to lock them, <laughs> like both those guys. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure. Today we have a, a special seminar by Philip Dow entitled, Should America Launch a Major Push into Solar Energy? This seminar is a joint seminar sponsored by the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, CTUSD, thanks to Alan Chirisheim, Alan, director of CTUSD, and three units at IIT, Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering, Department of Mechanical Material and Aerospace Engineering, and the Wanger Institute for Sustainable Energy Research, known as WISER. First of all, thanks to all of our IIT and C2SD guests and friends who just traveled to IIT today for this event. We appreciate, uh, we appreciate it very much, uh, and thanks to the weather. It's excellent for Chicago. <laughs> it could have been impossible like uh, 10 days ago. Uh, Philip Dow is, uh, is a retired founder and the senior executive of SunGuard Data System, a large specialized provider of the software and processing solutions for financial services, higher education, and public sectors. By the way, IIT Banner, those who are using IIT Banner software, are produced by SunGuard. So we benefit from, from uh, your vision long time ago, from long time ago, and it still continues. Phil receives a, a, a BS degree in material science and engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. I think our Alan Cram was the chairman of the uh, material science Carnegie Mellon, and John was the dean of engineering there. So we have a lot of connection to <laughs> university. And the MBA from neighboring uh, university, University of Chicago Graduate School of Business. So uh, Mr. Dow is a co-founder of SunGuard Investment System, Inc., one of the four original business that comprised SunGuard buyout from Sun Company in 1983. As one of the SunGuard's most senior and key operating executives, he played an instrumental role in SunGuard's evolution from its formation then to today. He was president of SunGuard Investment System, Inc. from 1982 to 1990. From 1990 to October 1998, Mr. Dow was the Chief Executive Officer of the Sangar Trust and Shareholder System Group. He is the visionary behind the Sangar uh, processing strategy, which formed the basis for Sangar Company Transaction Network. In 2002, uh, Phil retired as a Senior Vice President of Sangar Data System Inc. after uh, serving 32 years with the company. Today, Phil and his wife, uh, Marsha, uh, are very active uh, philanthropists in Chicago and at the uh, Fields Alba Mora Carnegie Mellon University, uh, where he serves on the Board of Trustees. Uh, they have established a uh, permanent endowment at CMU, Carnegie Mellon University, that provides seed funding for novel projects conducted by the faculty and students. Each year, after uh, uh, each year, about four to five graduate students are supported through this fund. The purpose of this fund is to allow investigators or faculty to obtain preliminary data and information that can be useful to write the large, large proposal for research funding uh, from federal or other agencies. Uh, I like this part because this is the, one of the goals of Wiser. So we can talk a lot <laughs> with uh, Phil about that and use his experience. Well, basically, SunGuard is the global leader in uh, integrated IT solution and e-processing for financial services. SunGuard is also pioneer as a leading provider of high availability of infrastructure for business uh, uh, continuity. 
currently as a trustee at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Phil is an active philanthropist in Chicago area. And also, I heard about the, his active golfer and sailor. So uh, I don't know that much but, uh, uh, about that, but I match him with some of the faculty who understand this. And there was a very, very lively discussion at the lunchtime also. Phil and Marsha, welcome to IIT. It's a, a great pleasure and honor to have both of you here at IIT today. Phil, we look forward to hearing from you, your view on solar energy solution for America. Phil? Thank you. First of all, can everybody hear me? Everybody hear me? No? Everybody can see this up here. How many engineers do we have in the audience? Faculty, wannabes, wow. <laughs> Business, businessmen, businesswomen, architects, any architects? How about attorneys? All right. <laughs> People in professions like these are often called upon to provide ballpark estimates of what something might cost. You do this to see if the project is technically feasible and its cost is somewhere close to what the customer wants to spend before going forward with it. It's done all the time. What I have done is develop just such a ballpark estimate for what it would take to run the entire U.S. economy on solar energy. That is the subject of this presentation. Now why am I doing this? Well, because whenever the subject of renewable energy comes up, the conversation usually turns to solar. And you hear statements like this one. Now this happens to be true. The planet does receive enough energy from the sun in about an hour or so to run the entire global economy for one year. You then ask yourself, why can't we just capture the energy from the sun and solve our energy problems that way? Well, are we anywhere close to being able to do this? To get at this question, I have constructed a little thought experiment. Here it is. Let's suppose that we convert the entire American economy to all electric, and we produce all of the electricity to power it from a solar facility. In other words, we stop burning carbon and capture the sun. What would this solar plant look like, and how much would it cost? First, we need to know how much electricity our solar plant must generate. The Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory has developed this analysis of the sources and uses of energy. It calculates the energy content of all of the fuels that drive the U.S. economy, shown here on the left. For example, they take the amount of coal consumed and multiply by the BTUs per ton of coal and so on. Add these up and the total is 95 quadrillion BTUs. That's 95, the number 95 followed by 15 zeros, or 95 quads as they call them. This is the total energy consumed by the U.S. economy in one year. Now some of this energy is converted into electricity, which is simply another form of energy. You see it here. Uh, this is some uh, coal, some natural gas, goes up here to this little block which represents the electric power industry. And then that electric power, represented by this bar, is delivered into the economy which is represented by this red box. The electricity plus the remaining forms of energy, for instance down here, see all this petroleum, for instance, goes directly into the economy, or uh, petroleum and byproducts. That electricity plus the remaining forms of energy constitute the energy input to the economy symbolized by the four pink boxes. These boxes represent the four main sectors of the U.S. economy, residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation. Total demand for energy from these sectors in the box is about 70 quadrillion BTUs or quads per year. 
This then is the amount of energy we must generate from our solar facility. Now before we go on, a couple of quick comments about this chart. Notice that 86% of all the energy we consume currently comes from fossilized carbon. But only two tenths of 1% currently comes from the sun. Now this is as of 2012. Over here on the right, because as you know, all you engineers know that you can't destroy energy. This is kind of a sources and uses of energy. It's kind of like a cash flow statement for the business people. Sources and uses of cash, same thing. Can't destroy cash, can't destroy energy. So what the energy you start with has to be the energy that you end up with. And it turns out that the energy either produces useful work, which is represented by this box, or it is lost or rejected. as uh, they call it. Of all the energy input to our economy, 61% is rejected or lost. Only 39% ends up providing useful work. So here's our objective. First, design a solar power plant that reliably delivers the electric energy equivalent of 70 quads to run the U.S. economy for one year or 56 times 10 to the 12th watt hours or 56 terawatt hours of electricity per day. Our solar facility would consist of a photovoltaic panel and a battery. The PV panel would generate enough electricity during the day to power the daytime economy and charge the battery. And the battery would power the economy at night. Second, estimate the cost of building the whole thing. Let's assume the following. PV panel would be spread out in the southwestern states because that is the sunniest place in America. And secondly, we build in a 50% safety factor to handle any contingency. If we start with a demand of 56 terawatt hours of electricity per day and add a 50% safety factor, we find we'll then need a system that can produce about 83 terawatt hours per day. Let's further assume that the nighttime demand will be half of that, or 41 terawatt hours. Now, keep in mind that all of these are just approximations. I know that the nighttime demand is less than the daytime demand, but at this point, I don't care. This is a back of the end envelope analysis. Okay, here's what these things look like, a typical solar power plant. Notice that the footprint of the power plant is greater than the size of the PV panel because there is a lot of open space between the panels along with access roads and so on. So we know what it looks like. How much space would it consume? The easiest way to estimate the footprint of a solar facility of this size is to look at the operating experience of existing solar power plants. Here are several examples. The sample shows that the actual output is in the 70 to 170 watt hours per day per square meter range. Let's assume that our plant's performance will be in the neighborhood of the plant at Nellis Air Force Base and produce about 150 watt hours per day per square meter. If we assume 150 watt hours per day per square meter for our power plant, then its footprint would be about 210,000 square miles. And just for your reference, the land area of the United States is about 4 million square miles, so that would be about 5% of the total land area of the U.S. So we have the power plant. Let's move on to the battery. For the battery, we will use technology known as pumped storage hydro. Here's a schematic of one of these plants. This method stores energy in the form of potential energy of water that's pumped from a lower elevation reservoir, which is down here, to a higher elevation reservoir that's up here. In our example, excess electric power from our solar facility that is produced during the day would be used to run the pumps 
fill the upper reservoir, pumping water from the lower reservoir through these pipes up the upper reservoir during the day. Then, at night, the stored water would be released through turbines to produce the electricity that would run the nighttime economy. So now you essentially have a little hydroelectric power plant runs down these pipes through the power plant chamber into the lower reservoir. Here's an example of one of these facilities. This one is on the eastern shore of Lake Michigan. The lower reservoir is Lake Michigan. Here it is right down here. And the upper reservoir is a man-made lake right up here. The drop, as it is called, that is the height of the upper versus the lower reservoir, is about 350 feet. And you know, this is located along the eastern edge. You know, these sand dunes, the bluffs that have been naturally formed over there. Here's another one. In this case, the lower reservoir is a river. There's the river. It's been dammed up. And here's the lower reservoir. And the upper is a man-made lake. Notice that all the workings of this facility, pipes, pumps, power plant, etc., are buried in the hill that separates the two. So you basically can't see any of it. And here's another one. In this case, the lower reservoir is the ocean. This is proven technology. Pump storage hydro is the largest capacity form of grid energy storage available. As of March 2012, the Electric Power Research Institute reports that pump storage hydro accounts for more than 99% of the bulk electric energy storage capacity worldwide, representing around 120,000 megawatts. There are about 50 pump storage plants with more than 1,000 megawatts of capacity and operation around the world. In 2009, the United States had about 21,000 megawatts or 21 gigawatts of pump storage generating capacity. Many of these plants have been built during the 1970s and have therefore been operating for more than 30 years. Now here are two good examples of pump hydroelectric storage in the U.S. The first, the one we just looked at, the facility at Ludington, Michigan is built on a bluff overlooking the east shore of Lake Michigan. It was constructed in 1969-1973. The Bath County facility is located in the northern corner of Bath County, Virginia, in the Allegheny Mountains. It was constructed in 1975 through 1985 and is currently the largest pump storage facility in the world. Here are the relevant specs. For the purposes of this analysis, we assume that the nighttime energy demand would be about half the daily demand, or 41 terawatt hours. If we fulfilled this requirement with pump storage, we would need about 1,000 facilities like Bath County, Virginia, or about 1,640 like Ludington, Michigan. Given the footprint of each of these facilities as shown, the total footprint would be about 1,300 square miles for the Bath County option and about double that for the Ludington option. What would all this cost? Assuming today's technology and today's cost, this power system would cost about $70 trillion to build. First, the PV panel. The Energy Information Administration, which is a, is a division of the uh, Energy Department, reports that the cost to build a photovoltaic power plant of 150 megawatt capacity averaged $3.90 a watt of capacity in 2012. The capacity of a solar power plant that could generate the required 83 terawatt hours of electricity would be about 17 terawatts. The installed front end cost of our facility would therefore be $3.90 times 17 terawatts or about $66 trillion. For the battery, if we use the actual construction costs of the two pump storage hydro projects that I showed you earlier, the Bath County option would cost a total of about $5 trillion and the Ludington option would cost about $3.5 trillion. So let's say the cost here would be $4 trillion. You add those two together, and you get $70 trillion. Now notice, this is the cost today. 
to build this system. The capital expense, or CapEx, it is not the cost to operate it, nor is it the so-called levelized cost or a life cycle cost of these facilities. So, to summarize, to power America with today's technology and today's cost, we would build first a solar power plant using photovoltaic panels, giving it a footprint of approximately 210,000 square miles, or about 5% of the land area of the U.S., and costing about $66 trillion to build. The battery would be pump storage hydro with a footprint of approximately 2,000 square miles, costing about $4 trillion to build, total about $70 trillion. Now, a few comments about all of this. Putting the PV power facility in the southwest makes sense from a solar energy point of view because this is the sunniest part of America. This is a map that shows solar inten intensity. Excuse me. This is a map that shows solar intensity, the annual direct normal irradiance, as they call it, across the U.S. As you can see, this is where most of the existing projects are located. Each one of these little dots represents one of these plants. They're mostly located down here in the southwest, although there is uh, at least a, you know, a few up here in Illinois. But this strategy has two problems. First, the southwest, defined as the southern California, starting about here, uh, through the southern tip of, of Nevada around Las Vegas, Arizona plus New Mexico plus the panhandles of Oklahoma and Texas, which is generally this area right here, constitutes about 400,000 square miles. Our facility would therefore cover about 50% of it. Secondly, if a major storm covered most or worse all of this, electrical output would drop dramatically and the whole country would suffer. We basically have a nationwide brownout. Putting our PV power plant in the southern states, defined as the southwest, all of this, basically going east plus all of the states east of the Atlantic coast, so generally along this line south, alleviates the storm risk scenario a little bit, but puts much of the panel in states that are not as sunny as the southwest, and so our PV panel facility would have to be larger to account for that. Even without this expansion, it would, it would occupy about 22% of it. Now, some people would say that much of the land in these states is empty. Nobody lives there. But others would say that it's wilderness or a grazing land or farmland. It's safe to say that either the Southwest or the Southern state strategy would provoke some real pushback. Well, how about PV panels on houses? A popular concept these days, but this is not the answer. There are about 89 million houses in the United States. If the owners of every one of them installed 1,000 square feet of PV panel on their roof, that's a, that's a panel that's 20 feet by 50 feet. If every one of them did that, the total area would be about 3,200 square miles, a lot of PV panel, but a small percentage of the needed area. There are 89 million houses in the United States. Currently, there are about 600,000 that have PV panels of some size on their roofs. It's six-tenths of 1%. Now, the capital cost of PV power plants is falling as the cost of PV panels drops. Today, PV panels cost about 74 cents a watt, one one-hundredth of the cost in 1977. But the PV panel is only one component of the total cost of a complete solar power plant. The so-called non-module costs, for example, inverters, mounting hardware, construction labor, permitting and fees, overhead, taxes, installer profit, etc., now make up at least two-thirds of the total installed cost of a typical plant. Further reductions in total cost will require significant reductions and these non-module costs. Now you might say, well, where did you get these costs? 
Maybe the real problem is your costs are too high. Other people say that the capex of these power plants is much lower. Well, my capex cost for a PV power plant comes from the EIA, the Energy Information Administration, it's a division of the Energy Park, and their numbers are based on projects that have been completed in 2013. You're right that there are other estimates out there that are lower. For example, Lazard, which is an investment banker, quotes a much lower number. But it is based on projections for projects that have just started. Remember that this whole exercise is based on today's technology and today's costs as defined by projects that are currently in production. Now here's a big issue. The battery stores only one night's worth of electricity. Well, what happens if a large weather system covers most of the PV panel? It is not unusual for large parts of the country to be covered by clouds. As a matter of fact, last week at some point, I looked at the weather underground uh, cloud map of the United States. I thought about 90% of the country was covered by clouds. When was the last time the sun shined in Chicago, for example? Well, what happens then? Well, to deal with that, we would need a backup system. And since it seems entirely possible that for some period of time all of the PV panel would be covered by clouds and that the electrical output of our solar system would drop to, say, 20 to 30 percent of its capacity, the backup system must be big enough to supply 70 to 80 percent of the energy that we need to run the economy. In other words, the backup system would basically be the electric power system we have today. You know, when you think about backup systems, there's one of two ways you can go about it. You can buy a backup. So like it's, let's say you're talking about your house, that you want to buy a generator, and you uh, want to buy a system that keeps the whole organization running for a relatively short period of time until you can shut down the operation, do a controlled shutdown, so that you can get everybody out of the elevators, you can uh, save all of your files, you can protect all your equipment, and so on and then everything shuts down. So the whole organization for a very short period of time. The other approach is to protect <coughs> just a small piece of the organization for a long period of time. So if in your house, for instance, you'd buy a generator that could run your refrigerator, that could uh, you know, run your hot water heater and a few other things, and keep it running for a week or so until the power comes back on. Well, you can't do that with the economy. You can't simply send out a text message to 315 million people that we're going to shut the economy down in an hour. Nor can you tell these people, okay, we're going to shut it down to about 10 or 20 percent of the most essential services, uh, police, fire, hospitals, every, and maybe some streetlights, every, everything else comes down. You're just going to have to deal with that until the sun starts shining again. You can't do that. So you have to be able to back up the whole economy. Now, the other thing to think about is, um, and you notice I have question marks here, uh, because I'm just sort of proposing this in a way. I'd be kind of interested in how you all respond to all this. Right now, today, about 20% of the energy we use comes in the form of electricity. So if we're going to electrify the whole economy and run everything on electricity, we essentially have to quintuple the amount of energy, uh, electricity we produce to run the whole economy. So let's suppose that we need a backup system. Well, if you needed a backup system to run maybe 80% of it, you'd basically then need a backup power system that looked like today's system that would be four times bigger than today's system. So the electric power industry would be four times bigger than it is today, and that would be your backup system. So you'd have a primary system, that's the solar energy system, that would be backed up by electric power system, the, basically the electric powers, industry, comet, and so on, that would be four times bigger than it is today. Now, building the solar power plant is not the only cost of capturing the sun. For example, electrifying the economy. We simply assumed at the beginning that the entire economy had to be electrified so that all energy is now supplied in the form of electricity. But this in itself would be an enormous project. By far the largest part of it would involve the electrification of the transport sector. 
The chart I showed you earlier shows that transportation is the largest user of energy, about 38%, and that almost all of it comes in the form of petroleum. Electrifying this sector would mean abandoning the internal combustion engine and converting to electricity all cars, buses, trucks, especially tractor trailers, ships, and the entire railroad network. We would also have to rebuild and expand the entire national electric grid. Today, power plants are located close to the user. Major cities, for example, Chicago, are surrounded by a network of power plants. Current grid technology limits the distance that electricity can be transported to about 300 miles. Our new solar system, however, would locate the power plants where the sun shines the most. So in theory, much of it would be located in the southwest. This means that the solar-based grid would be much larger and employ different technology than present because it must transport electricity much larger distances, for example, from Arizona to New Jersey. Finally, we would have to develop a computer network to control the whole system, the so-called smart grid. Work being done right here. The solar grid must be able to react to changes in the weather. Suppose we adopt the southern state strategy, so we position all the grid across the southern states. Further suppose that on Monday, the southwest is clear and the southeast is cloudy. On that day, huge amounts of electricity must move generally west to east. Then suppose that on Tuesday, the following day, the southwest is cloudy and the southeast is clear. On that day, huge amounts of the electricity must move generally east to west. This will be happening every day as weather systems move across America. The grid and control systems to handle this do not today exist. Finally, as always, this emerging technology must proceed against competition from the incumbent. In this case, the long-term competition is likely to be gas. To see how tough this will be, consider this. My back of the envelope designed for solar PV power features electricity only when the sun shines, so you need a battery. Plus, it's all susceptible to the weather, and the total cost is about $70 trillion to build it. A gas-fired power plant to produce the same results would produce electricity rain or shine day or night, so no batteries are needed, and a total cost would be about $4 trillion. This proposal is about 17 times the cost of the gas alternative. So now you say, so what? Sure, there are problems here. What difference does it make? We've done big projects with big risks before. And you're right. America is certainly capable of successfully sustaining large projects over long periods of time that require solutions to major engineering problems. Three examples are the Manhattan Project. The project to build the first atomic bomb spanned 1942 to 1946 and cost about $26 billion in today's money. Project Apollo. The project that put the first man on the moon spanned 1961 to 1972 and cost about $130 billion in today's money. The Interstate Highway System. This was, at the time, the largest public works project in our history and still might be. It was authorized in 1956 and was completed 35 years later at a cost of about $500 billion in today's money. Three very successful projects, but none of them, none of them even, appro even approaches the scale of what we're talking about here. So what did we learn from these projects? Maybe there are some important lessons here. What were the keys to their success? Number one, a perceived threat or reward that leads to public acceptance. The Manhattan Project and Apollo Project were both responses to perceived threats, which compelled policymaker support for these initiatives. The interstate highway system was perceived as an enormous jobs program that would also produce a big jump in economic productivity. Secondly, a clear goal. Each product had a clear goal. Build the bomb, put a man on the moon, by the end of 1969, build the interstate highway system. Number three, government money that ensures success. 
all three projects were funded by the government. For example, the Manhattan Project consumed about 1% of the federal budget during its life, and Project Apollo consumed about 2% during its life. The interstate highway system was self-funded via a gas tax that is now 18.4 cents per gallon. So how does our solar project score on these three success factors? Perceived threat or reward? Well, climate change and or the exhaustion of fossil fuels. But does the American public buy into this? Recent polls suggest that it does not. Clear goal. Well, electrify the U.S. economy, generate the electricity with a solar-based system. But whereas the interstate highway system for example, generated huge benefits to Americans. It is not clear if there are any near-term economic benefits from, for example, converting transportation from carbon to solar-produced electricity. And finally, government money to ensure success. The government's role in all three projects was to provide the funding. But given the huge amounts of money required and the fiscal shape in which governments at all levels find themselves, Governments today are in no position to fund this entire project. So what to do? Well, here's what I propose. I call it Plan A. The reason I call it Plan A is I, frankly, hope that you all can come up with Plan B, C, D, and so on, so that eventually when we get to Plan Q, we'll have something that actually works. First of all, more research and development is required to do two things. We need to double the efficiency of PV panels. The current PV panels that are used in these plants convert only about 15 to 20 percent of all the sun's energy into electricity. We have to double that to 30 to 40 percent. Secondly, we have to reduce by one half the cost of building one of these PV power plants. Success in both A and B would effectively reduce the cost of the PV power generation system to one quarter of the current estimate, approximately, or about $15 trillion. When these are both accomplished, but only then, raise the capital to build the system by imposing a dollar and a quarter tax on each gallon of gasoline and diesel fuel. Americans currently burn about 135 billion gallons of fuel so the tax would bring in about $170 billion a year. Note that this is about 1% of current GDP. At this rate, the whole system, power generation plus the batteries, assuming these improvements in current technology and current cost and no others, this project would take about 100 years to build. Finally, as with any energy plan, we must continue to work on energy efficiency. The chart above shows that I showed you in the beginning shows that of the 70 quads of energy supplied to the economy, about 47% of them are rejected or lost. Improving energy efficiency, as measured by the number of BTUs per dollar of GDP, is an absolute must, regardless of the way forward. So a final comment. The intent of this exercise is to arrive at a ballpark estimate of what it would take to stop burning fossilized carbon and capture the sun. There is obviously a large margin of error, plus or minus, in all of it. But even if you set aside the whole issue of climate change, one thing is certain. Eventually, we homo sapiens will consume all of the planet's supply of fossilized carbon. Long before that time, we must develop an alternative to burning that carbon. It's a good bet that solar will eventually be a major part of our energy equation. The good news about the sun is that it is, for all practical purposes, an inexhaustible source of energy. It's free, and it's available to everyone. No country can seize control of the sun and deny it to others. But it is also true that solar power today supplies only about two-tenths of one percent of the energy to run the U.S. economy. To get where we want to go, that is to a hundred percent, we need much better solar technology, much lower cost to build it, 
We must electrify the entire economy, including transportation, build a national grid with long-distance electricity transport, and a smart grid that cannot be hacked. Against stiff competition from low-cost fossilized carbon alternatives, for instance, gas, the public's lack of interest, and the government's lack of money. Now, those of you wanting to chase down the provenance of the numbers and the calculations to get uh, the calculations to get the results displayed here, I invite you to go to this website. It holds the article from which all of this has sprung. It includes about 40 endnotes, so this should explain everything. Thank you all for your time and attention. Question, sure. Okay, well, that brings to mind a, a, a poll I'd like to ask you all. Uh, we have to double the efficiency of PV panels, reduce the cost by half. How many of you think that this can happen in 10 years? Raise your hand. How many people think you could actually do this? Double the efficiency of PV panels, reduce by half the cost of building these PV power plants. Now, for instance, all these pants are basically standard. You get a, a PV panel, you, you put it on a, a structure of some kind, you nail the structure to the ground, you nail the PV panel to the structure, and then you have to wire it all up. Why not make all of the components in a central factory something? And remember, we're going to build thousands of square miles of these things. Build all the components in a factory, put them in a truck, send the truck out to the job site, and have an industrial robot unpack components from the truck and build this, build the plant. Why not do that? So just a couple of ideas. How many people think that this could happen, A and B? There's not all that much optimism. Is anybody in the back two rows raising their hands? You are the people that are going to have to do this. <laughs> ay, yeah, yeah. OK, let's suppose 10 years from now we've done this. How many of you then, I'm going to ask you two questions on this one. How many of you think we should charge a dollar and a quarter? If it is a carbon tax, right? dollar and a quarter a gallon of gasoline to help finance this thing. That's what we should do. Well, there's a whole block over here that says no. OK. <laughs> OK, how many of you think that 10 years from now this is actually going to happen? A buck and a quarter. Okay. See, that's kind of the problem, isn't it? Okay, any other questions? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Charlie?
Okay, people building uh, plants here in the U.S. Yeah, the, you remember I showed you the map, and all of those little circles represented uh, one of these solar plants. So uh, people have been building solar plants uh, starting in Southern California since the mid-'80s. So it's been going on for 30 years. And those are the, some of the ones that I uh, showed you. Now, as far as Tesla goes, he's talking about building chemical batteries. You know, the battery that I talked about was this pump storage hydro. This is, you know, for grid storage, I think this is the kind of the uh, best option at this stage of the game. I did this exercise in, in the beginning, the first pass of this exercise. I used as a battery car batteries, 12-volt lead-acid car batteries. How many car batteries does it take to run the U.S. economy for one night? Turns out, 70 billion. And it would cost 10 or 15 trillion dollars to buy them. And they would, because the charge and discharge cycle for a lead acid battery is about 300, three, at the end of the first year, because you're charging and discharging them every 24 hours, at the end of the year, they'd all be uh, gone. They'd all be uh, ruined and you'd have to scrap them and buy another 10 or 15 trillion dollars of them. So it just didn't make any sense at all. Now that doesn't, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. Doesn't mean that we're not going to use uh, chemical batteries in any case because there's probably going to be levels of battery storage and you could have, you know, regional storage facilities. You could have, you have a big storage facility right now at this university. Uh, individual homes might have storage and that could be where the Tesla batteries comes in. The batteries are not a very good way to store electricity, unfortunately. So. Phil, uh, as you know, I'm one of the businessmen here. Yes, and the, and the problem I have with your analysis is that the uh, $170 billion a year with the, cat, with the gas tax is a deteriorating or diminishing uh, product. If you're converting to electricity, you have no more gas consumption. And if the goal is to reduce consumption, you don't have the, the cap the dollar and a quarter a gallon doesn't raise any money. A good, very good point. <laughs> Thank you, and I expect, as a homework assignment, I would expect you to come up with another alternative. Thank you. He's absolutely right. I mean, we're going to get rid of, particularly in the transportation sector, we're going to get rid of all that gas. So let's just think of something else. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm assuming the number you gave for the uh, transportation energy use estimate includes um, plane transportation as well, because, uh, for example, to convert that to electrical power, uh, you would probably need to entirely replace that system with something like high-speed rail. And so I'm wondering if that's a cost that should be evaluated as well. Yeah, this, this, for, for the purposes of one of these ballpark estimates, we just ignore that. But I mean, I'm sorry, you're right. I mean, I don't know how to deal with uh, air travel. I, I don't know what to do. I, I would imagine that would never be electrified. I don't know how you could uh, run a 747 on batteries. So. Do you happen to know what percentage that currently uses of the? No, I don't. Okay. Any other questions? While they're searching for one, we'll take this young lady here. <laughs> Yeah, that's, we'll tax something. We'll tax something else. That's a that's an easy problem for politicians. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. The only comment I have is that much of the numbers that you are presenting here are based on the assumption is that you're building a power system for responding to peak. In the sense that in the U.S. we're building lots of highways because everybody wants to go home at 5 p.m. If you look at the highways at 2 a.m., there's nobody on the road. So if you manage the load better by utilizing smart grid, maybe the infrastructure would not be that complicated. So the numbers that you're presenting now is basically assuming that you're building this uh, uh, solar PV based on the existing system. 
which is not a correct assumption. Right, existing once demand. You implement the smart grid, maybe right. half of this load will be implemented. Or, right, or yeah. And I, and I'm, I'm, I, I just want to say again, it's based on the current demand for energy, and I don't know where the demand for energy is going to go. So I just, uh, you know, as a ballpark thing, uh, I just use that number. What he's talking about is is uh, demand management by trying to reduce the demand for electricity, demand for energy, uh, you know, more improvements in mileage on cars, greater energy efficiency. But then on the other hand, maybe the economy grows faster than our efficiency grows, so the ge general demand for energy goes up. I, <coughs> I really don't know. But I just use that kind of as a general number uh, to do this little analysis. You're absolutely right. <clears throat> Hi, I have a question regarding the backup system with the water. Um, to places located. The battery? The, you mean the battery? The batteries, yeah, the yeah. water battery. Mm -hmm. um, what about the water supply? How much water is needed in the places that aren't able to supply that, that aren't located like offshore? Right. Uh, actually, I think America is pretty well placed for that. I mean, I haven't figured that out, to be honest with you. But um, America has uh, lots of mountains and we have lots of water. And uh, for instance, uh, we have to, several mountain ranges. We have a, a gigantic river system that can produce the water to fill these. And, and you just you have to fill them just once. You know, you're not flushing the water anywhere. So once you fill the lower reservoir up, the system will run, uh, and you just have to replace the evaporation. So, you know, you could build these things in Arizona where there is no water. Build a pipeline from someplace. Pipe the water in. Build a reservoir up, and then disconnect the pipeline, and because we have lots of water. Phil, I thought your presentation was excellent. Thank you. Um, I have a comment. It's not really really a question, so I won't try to bend it into a question. Uh, an observation that I would make for all of the young people here and doing future analyses and so forth, I've always in the recent years had a bit of a difficulty with the presentations. We also want to look at the U.S. system. And of course the driver to get off of fossil fuels uh, is clearly, you know, global warming consideration and it's a global consideration. So consequently, I believe that our, the electric uh, generating capacities and generation in China uh, has now exceeded the US in parts of the world that have uh, very significant uh, rates of growth going forward as compared to what we have here, a pretty sophisticated but a very modest growth factors. So as I was listening to your presentation, I was trying to think maybe more globally and trying to, you know, you, you took this concept of where we are now, what it would cost now. Uh, there are parts of, the, of the, the global economy that are growing at a very rapid rate. Just keeping up with the growth, let alone where we are, is a significant consideration. So my pitch is, or my comment is, in considerations of, um, global warming, we have to really look global and not l just look to our, our system here in the U.S. That's, that's my only comment. Right. I think that's a good point. I, uh, uh, just to, to speak to that, <clears throat> for instance, uh, some of these areas in the world don't use very much electricity. They're developing, and their demand is going to grow up dramatically. Uh, for instance, in sub-Saharan Africa, the population of sub-Saharan Africa is about 900 million people, they consume about as much energy as the state of Alabama that has 5 million people. So obviously over the next 50 years or so, 100 years, they're going to, uh, they're going to, their energy demand is going to uh, grow dramatically. Now I would also say, uh, kind of to that point, it is a global problem. I mean, this is not uh, a local problem that's got to be solved here in Chicago or here in the United States. It could be a problem that's solved somewhere else because one of the problems of solar or any kind of emerging technology, you have to find a place 
to compete where the incumbent, where the competition that's there, that's entrenched, is weak, as expensive, and it's not, the, the quality is very poor, so that you have a chance to undercut the price and to improve the quality. Now, as an example, where uh, solar would be very competitive today is in the rural parts of Africa, for instance, and places like India. Um, People in, uh, that are off the grid in places like Africa, for instance, generate light by burning kerosene uh, in kerosene lanterns. And uh, an article I saw in The Economist uh, recently said that that's equivalent to buying electricity for $100 a kilowatt hour. Now remember, we pay 11 cents a kilowatt hour here in Chicago. So they're paying like a lot of 1,000 times more for their electricity because it comes from kerosene. And by replacing these kerosene lanterns with, let's say, a single family uh, small solar system that has a couple of square meters of solar panels plus a battery plus uh, two or three LED lights, uh, you, can, you can pay a system like that off in about five years. It costs maybe $50 to $100 to manufacture a system like that. And with the amount of money that family saves from not having to buy kerosene, that kind of a system could pay off for five years. You can't do that here in the United States because the cost of electricity is so low and so on. So the real advances in solar technology may come in places like Africa and India. It doesn't, they don't have to come here. Um, yeah, I was wondering how much you have, you have like an estimate on how much it would be to change all transportation to renewable energy. No, I have no idea. Oh, okay. I mean, for instance, we have, just talk about the railroads. We have 200,000 miles of mainline track in America. I don't know what it would cost to electrify it. The technology is very well known. I mean, uh, railroads along the eastern seaboard are all electric. All the European railroads are electrified. So I don't know what it would cost, but if it costs a couple million dollars a, a mile, which sounds to me probably reasonable, then we were talking about $400 billion. <clears throat> so just, just for that piece. And I don't know how. I, you know, here's a good homework assignment for all you uh, kids in the back two rows. Design an 18-wheeler that runs off a of battery. What size of battery? Take the biggest battery you could. Take one of these Tesla batteries that he's, uh, Musk is bragging about, and and see how uh, see how big a battery you'd need to drive an 18 wheeler, uh, 300 miles. Thank you very much for your presentation. Very intriguing. Um, I'd I'd like to concur with a, a couple of comments that you made that um, in other areas it may be more palatable and. Uh, far few challenges, or fewer challenges. For example, in the U.S. Virgin Islands, where we have a project now, uh, they pay 54 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh -huh. So this is a perfect example. Good example. Um, Islands, good example. Yeah. And in fact, uh, we're, we're now focusing on uh, an entire island um, and powering one island as a right. microgrid, and so another perfect example. And in places like that, where the cost is higher, or in places like Africa, uh, where there may be limited or no access to power, you'll also have fewer um, challenges with objections because people have a far greater need. They're much more hungry to have power at all or right. power at a lower cost. Right. Yeah, the, the, the point about islands is, is an excellent one because uh, the problem that islands have is that they have to import, they, ge they generally uh, generate electricity by burning oil. Uh, and they have to import the oil or, uh, or something, or diesel fuel, for instance. They've got a diesel generator. It's expensive, and that's why the, co the electricity is so expensive. In Hawaii, for instance, uh, the ratepayers pay 35 cents a kilowatt hour. Again, we pay 11 cents here, 35 cents. So solar is very attractive to people uh, that live in Hawaii that have houses in Hawaii. A lot of them have solar water heaters, for instance, and a lot of them have also tried to install 
uh, solar panels on their roofs. It's a place where there's a lot of sun and where the cost of electricity is very high. Good, good point. He's going to. I was wondering what is your opinion on wind energy, since that has not been mentioned, but is also a uh, um, source that is uh, unlimited. And those could be placed uh, further up north as well as offshore, so we don't have such a high land uh, requirement. Yeah, that's a topic of another. Invite me back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Alan had a question? Yeah, because you're looking at such a big picture analysis, I just had a couple naive slash ridiculous questions. Um, one is, uh, does the cost of this, if we're assuming it's more of a global problem, does global grid or connecting large portions of the world that already are electrified, does that bring the overhead down or is that going to bring the cost up to implement this? And the second question is, I mean, we're seeing large, you know, you're almost, you're up in almost three digit trillions. Um, what's the cost of putting this all in space? And then we don't have to worry about whether it's snowing or not. Yeah, probably more. I assume. But <laughs> have you looked at either of those? Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of ideas out there. One of them is to uh, try to put uh, uh, some kind of a solar facility in orbit. But the problem with that is that you have to put it in geostationary orbit. It's a gigantic structure. It has to go way up there. It would cost a fortune to get it up there. Then you, you collect the energy, turn it into some gigantic microwave, and beam it down to the Earth and hope, hope that the, that the beam doesn't start wandering around. <laughs> it's, there was a James Bond movie did that yeah, effect, yeah, as yeah. I recall. Oh, man. Alan. So uh, just two quick points. I think if we had a dollar twenty-five uh, tax on gasoline, we'd be called Europe. Oh, I, be I bet you we could go to five dollars yeah. before <laughs> we go to Europe. Yeah. But I, I mean, I, I, I love back of the envelope, uh, big uh, picture analysis, and I, I really enjoyed what you did. And, and what it says is there's no one solution here. Right. That you're not going to one solution, and you have to think about multiple solutions. Everyone bringing up airplanes is right, and you know there are things. I mean, the fact is, you're not going to turn the steel industry into an electrical steel industry. There's no technology available for that right now, mm -hmm. and you need steel. So, so it has to be, you know, some sort of amalgam. But, it, but the one thing you did say is, it tells you the most important thing is for us to minimize energy use. Mm. Personally. The governments everywhere, and that's the one area with it uh, I think people don't step up to, is to personally minimize energy use. Because the, the answer actually is in don't use the energy. Right. And, and we're just a society that wastes energy. Right, yeah. Don't reduce the energy and also make more efficient use of it. Uh, those are two of the big, those are the cheapest ways to get to where we want to be. That's for absolute certainly. And you're right. I don't know that. I, I want to give the last question. So you have a very hot and burning question. Who has that? <laughs> yeah, the last two rows. That's the last row. Don't, don't we have a homework assignment? <laughs> <coughs> well, none of, none of them have left. That's OK, so how does solar electricity, does this affect wildlife? Because you could put like solar blocks or whatever, you know, on hills and things, but how does this affect our wildlife? Like we can cut down the forest just to put like a solar sure. thing. Well, yeah, I mean, if you, if you cover 50% of the Southwest with a solar panel, what would that do to anything that's living there. And uh, if you put a solar panel over a piece of ground, you uh, completely block the sun. So whatever is underneath it either has to go somewhere else or die, because if it depends on sunlight. You block the rain, too, if there is any. Uh, there's no question that it has a huge impact. Plus, if you have a big panel like that, the sun comes down upon it, it re-radiates some of the energy. Uh, 
Uh, some of the air energy goes up into the air, creates a gigantic thermal, potentially. It could, it could modify the climate. I mean, 200,000 square miles. So you'd have to, you know, you'd have to disperse it around, I, I suppose. If, um, if you put 1,000 square miles of solar panel in southern Illinois, for instance, uh, you'd basically be co-opting 1,000 square miles of farmland and uh, food production. Now, maybe there are farmers downstate that would love to uh, get out of the business of farming and, and put solar panels on their property. But on the other hand, is that good for America that we uh, take that much uh, land out of production? So there are all kinds of unintended consequences of these things. And you'd have to go forward carefully uh, to make sure that you don't make matters worse. Well, okay. Uh, there's a lot of questions, a lot of thank you very much. and uh, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting seminar.